Let's call the September 8th meeting of the Sunday County Health and Human Services Board to order. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, Jennifer Babornik, Carol Pearson, Dale Olson, and Lorraine Bouget are absent. Okay. Thank you. Next item is the meeting agenda. Audience recognition. We have people from the audience who wish to speak. Can you folks hear me down there? Not well. Maybe not, Dale. I'm sorry. Not well. Okay, I'm sure they can't. I'll, I'll try to speak up. Is there anybody in the audience who would wish to say anything? Are any of you here to address the board? Yes. Okay. Arlene Alm. Please stand up and say your name and we have Arlene. How many how many people want to speak? Okay, please go ahead. We have three minutes apiece for audience recognition. You can step forward too and there's a microphone on the table because we have people listening um, virtually that <laughs> Okay. I'm Arlene Alm from the Winter site, and I would like to um, address my opinion of hopefully working on keeping the site open. Are you referring to the senior resource center? Yes. Okay. And because of the distance of mileage from Epsilon, we have to go away to, to Loretta, and it's not cost effective to go mileage wise. It's just as much um, cost as having the site open, actually, I would think. And our people don't at that end, maybe we don't have the numbers, but as you all know, it's pretty sparrow stone in there. Lots of words between each parent or person. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the board? Yeah, I'm, I'm Dan Brad. I, I actually own the senior center in winter. Uh, years and years ago, I, I put up the, the old senior center. I built it for the senior citizens to try and give them a place to rent cheaply. And when this new building came available, I managed to get them into a bigger newer building where their outpay is still is the same 325 a month of what they were paying at the other one. Um, that building was built in 2004. It's a good sized building. Uh, but to me, there's no comparison to the building in, in Exland. They've got a far better setup than Winter. Uh, it really hurt the community in Winter to see that thing go. Um, I, I really would like to see that stay open. That's all I can think of the same. That's okay, thank you. Anyone else in the audience? Okay. Is there anybody virtually here? The audience members who would wish to speak? Uh, yeah, we have one. Okay, please state your name and go ahead. Dale, this is Joey over at the Senior Resource Center. The winter site is temporarily closed because of COVID-19 and because of the numbers at both sites, it wasn't cost effective for us to keep both sites open. So we decided to combine the two sites. And yes, it is more costly for someone to come to Exland to pick up the meals. 
but unfortunately there weren't enough numbers and when we started when you start paying the lights the dumpster electricity and all of that kind of stuff we were going in the hole probably right now i haven't seen the numbers from rose this week yet but as of two months ago, the winter site, we were losing close to $7,000 by keeping it open and not combining with winter. And for the mileage, I just received a grant from Meals on Wheels America for $37,000. And part of that $37,000 is earmarked to go towards mileage and more Meals on Wheels drivers. Um, we have been effectively looking, making phone calls. I spoke with Brenda Adler next week, last week. She is talking with people, but we desperately need drivers, not just in the winter and excellent area, but in the Hayward area. In the Hayward area, for example, we are serving 85 to 100 meals every day, which means equates to six meal routes a day, two of which of those routes are done three days a week by the bus and one route five days a week. So, I mean, it's kind of hard all over given the fact that a lot of people don't wanna drive or do meals because of COVID-19. So our best effort was to combine those two sites to try to save some money until we get through COVID-19. The sites are not, is not being closed, but right now we couldn't financially continue to run the site the way we were. Thank you for that. You're and welcome. We'll hear from you later on the agenda as well. Okay. And you folks are welcome to stay for that too, of course. Okay, minutes from the previous meeting. I have a motion to approve. Motion to approve as presented. Okay. Mr. Chairman. So a second. A second. Okay, motion and a second. Uh, I'm terrible at faces, let alone mask faces. Please give me your name when you speak up. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Everybody in favor to approve the agenda. Minutes of the previous meeting, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Thank you. Committee reports. We didn't have anybody here from us Oh, we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to um, keep updating things as we're moving along. <clears throat> we are um, in the process of filling in our program with uh, behavioral health and um, our men's shelter. Um, we hired a uh, I'm not sure if we mentioned her name last time we were in here. Um, an addiction specialist. Um, and we'd like to bring her out here to meet the county board if you don't know her. Dr. Steck. And um, she's now, she's been doing her program now. She's meeting with her, her clientele. So we're reaching out to those who are battling addiction to help them get the help that they need. And then we still continue to um, provide the support needed for those who need treatment. And the men's shelter, um, I think is at full capacity. And we're trying to expand it to where we can have more men. So at one point, I think there was 14, then there was 12. So it kind of fluctuates depending on what the need is. And, who needs that support, um, but we are building on that also, so we can what try to your, add on more room. What is your capacity? Um, I think it is 14, I think it's a max, but we're trying to um, build rooms at the lower level. So we've got to have that window, what you call that window, put in so that you can escape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're putting that in to have more rooms downstairs. And um, again, to tie in with the services we have in the community. So um, those are some of the things that we've been working on, but we're also um, putting together some quarantine homes for those people who are gonna need that quarantine, who need that support. They can't stay in their own home because- And they can't if they don't either have a home or if there's other children or there's other reasons why they need more support. Um, we want to have that 
we're setting it up now to be able to provide more. We have some, but we don't have as many. So now we're going to be putting in more. Um, the ultimate goal is eventually have more transitional housing for those who are coming home from treatment or those who are coming home from the system and trying to get back in the community and need a place to go so we can help address that need, help them go back out in the community. Um, so we have short-term plan and long-term plans to address those issues that people need and that we um, continue to pull our resources together to, to help them. And um, what were some other things too? Um, hire a new medical director. Yeah, we hired a new medical director. Um, he's been with us now, what, three weeks? Three weeks. So three weeks. Dr. Steve? Miskimich. Miskimich. Yep. So he's been with us three weeks now. And we're filling in positions at our health clinic. So we are going to be adding more personnel on here also. And um, we are in the process of building our daycare center. And we are pulling together the staff we're going to need for that and resources we will need to operate that. But right now we're in the construction stage. But initially it's going to be for COVID. Another, because we really don't know yet. What's the date there will be for COVID? Initially, it's for the COVID crisis. If we need that, we don't know yet what's going to happen in the community. Right. If we see an outbreak and we need more room or space, it's going to provide that need. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to turn over to a daycare, which our community needs. So that's the long term plan. So we're trying to address what we need for the people all the way around. So we've needed that for a long time in the daycare. So that's, that's in the process. And our fire hall um, is also another need that we have for our community. So we can provide that care for the people. So that's where we're at with some of the bigger projects and trying to um, address some of the housing needs we have in the community. We have a lot of people who are on that waiting list, whether it be through the tribe or the county, and it, it just, we have a housing need. And um, we are planning on um, building more housing units besides our housing authority. Separate from that, <laughs> because some people don't fall into that criteria, but they need a home. And um, so we're going to be looking into that also. And our college is um, growing. We're turning into a four-year campus, or we are offering that now. And now we're going to be expanding, so that'll provide more education for our people and, and opportunity for our community. So that's where we're at with some of the things we're having. Any questions? Lorraine, the um, behavioral health physician, Dr. Who? Dr. Steve, oh, behavioral health, Tina Steck. Um, Tina Steck. Last name? S T E C. Is she just doing um, patients from LCA right now? She um, except outside. The yeah, they're just, considering partnering. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, and now she's working. MISQ. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And then our, we're going to comment on our school starting virtually the first month. And how do you go? The tribal school, they were contemplating on the 21st being the starting, well, 21st set. They were going to try to go back one step sooner with the little ones. They're going back, but we didn't approve that. We're waiting to see what happens during this holiday. We're waiting to see what's happening now with, with the surge that's happening in the communities around us. We don't feel comfortable yet to have it open to everybody. So we're watching that date. The little ones go back October 1st, depending on what's happening with the coronavirus. So we're trying to monitor and keep an eye on the situation with the health is of our community. We try to keep our young people safe and our community safe. So that's where we are. Okay, the building that you want 
eventually to become the daycare for the first use of COVID quarantine? If we, if we have an outbreak like we were seeing around the country, multiple, yeah. and we have that need, that's where we're going to house them. Okay, and the other houses you spoke about for quarantine houses will eventually be used for residential houses? Yes. Okay. The ones that we are putting in place. They will. It's good for anyone. That's where we're at right now, is what we're doing. And we're, we're still doing the testing. We have testing dates set up for the community who just come in and test, the rapid test. Um, I'm not sure when the next one is, but we just had a couple more. So we want to continue to assess the community and see what's happening out there. And to keep an eye on that. Don Pettit has a hand up. Okay, I'm not seeing that on mine, so I'm sorry I missed that, Don. Go ahead, Don. Ms. Gouge, I'd like to ask you, uh, are you guys uh, putting out in the community could be because of the Red Cliff uh, resolution that was done on Friday and then they picked up some more cases and now Bad River has uh, one additional, their first COVID case. And my understanding is from two, a gathering, there was two gatherings, not this weekend, but the prior weekend. And my concern is that tr some of the tribal members or some of the residents of Sawyer County attended this gathering. And I'm trying to figure out uh, if it's going out within the uh, tribal community uh, that they need to be not traveling, they need to not be going to big gatherings, and we need to try to keep this under wraps. I am the uh, the COVID coordinator out at the the college, and um, I, I field this all weekend for the Red Cliff Reservation with the outbreaks because we had uh, a student that happened to be in the outreach site on re on the Red Cliff Reservation. And that's where this is coming from because now we had people at LDS uh, and Bad River that attended that event up on uh, Red Cliff. So I guess my concern is, are we getting it out to the community that it cannot, they cannot be attending these gather, gatherings? Not only the tribal community, any resident of Sawyer County. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very disheartened over the weekend to see so many unmasked, uh, visitors within our county and outside of our county and I'm very concerned about the numbers that are going to be coming in from the Labor Day holiday and the excellent trout fest and we will also be then having our Birchwood uh, bluegill fest is coming up so I'm trying to figure out if uh, if anything is is going to go out for within the La Couture Ojibwe Ojibwe uh, and make a statement regarding that we need to try to keep this under control and, and everybody needs to slow the spread and uh, stay home. I guess that's my question. We did pass a resolution about a month ago. Tweed, was that about a month ago? Yep, yep, and, yep, yep. Um, so they're supposed to be practicing those safety measures. Oh, it's safer at home. Yeah, yeah it's safer at home ordinance um, to remind them to keep practicing was healthy ways we were trying to stay safe. And we encouraged them strongly to not have big gatherings or to be distanced and to wear masks and to keep the sanitizer side to close them. So we were trying to discourage that as much as we can. And you're right. That's why these outbreaks are happening with these young adults, the college age, because of the socializing they are doing and not taking the safety measures. So, yes, I'm just very concerned on. for the 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 Ojibwe, and um, I just don't want it to explode, and then we can't get it under control for the elderly, and that's what I'm worried about because we all know that they are going, and they're not abiding by it, mm -hmm. and that's what worries me about it. Okay. I can't remember who moved to accept the SMA coordinator's report now, or else it's just okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jim. Uh, Senior Resource Center, Joey. Yep, this is Joey. I'm here. Please go ahead. All right. Okay. Um, you all should have received copies of the budget and the letter that goes with it. Our budget reflects a 0% um, increase um, in our budget this year. The only increase that will be in our budget will be the county's match for the 8521, which is the bus. And I just received the numbers today. Um, the money that we get from the DOT for the 8521 is $79,889. And the county match would be $15,978. Um, the only thing that we did not do for the 8521 in 2020 was because of COVID-19, we could not do the fundraising to purchase a new bus. So that will have to come into effect. Um, this next year, we'll have to reapply or apply for a bus. So we'll have to do fundraising for that. Um, this past year, because of COVID starting in March, we were not able to do any fundraising, so we approximately lost about $20,000. We were able to make up $10,000 in donations. A lot of people gave us donations out of their stimulus checks. We have so far received $10,000 from the Meals on Wheels grant in the first round, and I just received notification and we received the check of $37,000 for the second round of Meals on Wheels of America grant. That particular grant will go to help, as I said earlier, to help subsidize and get new drivers to pay mileage. It will also help to, if we need to hire any part-time help, we need to hire part-time help in Hayward because we've gone from three Meals on Wheels routes to six right now. So we have you know, money put in there for that. There's a chunk of the money that's going for all of the PPE things that we need for when we can open. We have a list started and we will be starting to order late this week or next week all the things that we need. Um, we have someone coming in to measure all of our sites for the plexiglass for the um, sneeze guards and stuff like that. There's a lot of things that have to go in place. Um, we are considered still in phase one of COVID before we can reopen. We can't reopen until we get to phase three, which would mean that, for example, you would call a senior center and you would say, I'd like to come to lunch today. And we would say something on the order of, well, we have one or we have two seatings open for 1130, but we have three open at 1230. We will not be able to just open up our doors and let all 25, 15 people or whatever come in. It will be based upon what, um, the square footage of that room is. So, um, so with the fact that we did a zero increase on the budget, we were, um, it was kind of communicated to us that we should look at a 0% increase. So we know that we have to step things up this again this next year for fundraising. We're hoping that we can get back to at least by January 1st having bingo again because that typically um, affords us about 30 to $35,000 every year. Um, the advisory board in Hayward has plans and ideas before COVID-19 for fundraising for the 20 to $25,000 that we have to put away towards our new bus in 2021. Um, we've been very fortunate and I think part of the reason that we can go, it's not a big financial um, burden for us to go with a 0% increase because we've been very fortunate. Um, when I look at COVID-19, we were able to get the payroll protection plan from the federal government. We had the safe at home monies, we had the CARES, we had Family First, we had all those different things that were able to help us. We had a lot of help and support from the ADRC. We had someone delivering meals for us one or two days a week. So that was a big help for us. Um, we have staff members um, that are delivering meals one or two days a week. We have the bus that's doing meals two days a week. So that's helped us you know, save along the way. Unfortunately, um, with the COVID, 
you know, a lot of people because of loss of income, a lot more people getting Meals on Wheels because they can't go out, they're afraid to go out. Some can pay, some can't pay. We've had some at some of our sites, we've had um, some deficits. So it's been difficult and hard decisions to make. And that's one of the reasons why we combined Winter and Excellent because we found ourselves in a position where we were putting more money out and we were getting farther and farther in the hole. The other positive thing that's, going, that's positive for us going into 2021, on October 1st, or as soon as we get in the final two statements, we will have every debt paid off from the previous director. We will no longer have any debt. All of our bills, all the past bills, whatever will be paid. So we will be going into 2021 with no debt that we have to worry about. It will all be taken care of. The other thing that a lot of people um, talked about or knew about was the Timber Girl trailer and smoker. Those were purchased and bought and removed out of my yard this weekend. So they're gone. So that money will go towards the debt that we have left that will be paid off on October 1st. So we're gonna be clear and we're gonna start 2021 with a clear state slate with no back bills that we have to pay from the previous director. Does anybody have any questions for Joey? Pardon? I, I asked if anybody had any questions for you. Hang on a second. Hey, hi, Joey. Hi, Tweed. Tweed here. Um, Joey, you're asking for a zero increase in your yeah. 2021 budget, is that correct? Correct, yeah. And does that include um, combining the excellent and winter sites or? No, that's just temporary. The budget reflects as if all sites would be open as always. So when do you plan to reopen the winter site? When we can open up all of our sites to the public again. Because right now, the, there's only about some days it's 12, sometimes it's 17 people that we deliver meals to in winter. And when you're only depositing $150 a month, that doesn't pay the $425 a month rent. It does not pay the $170 every two months um, for the dumpster. It doesn't pay the $279 um, for the electrical bill, the water and sewer, all those things. So we found ourselves getting farther and farther in the hole. So we decided that we could combine. Unfortunately, when we combined and with at all of our sites, we're dealing with not having drivers. But no, as soon as we can open up our sites, winter will open back up. Yeah. But our budget reflects as if all sites, all four sites are open as usual before COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Is there anybody online waiting to speak? Uh, Don is. Go ahead, Don. Ms. Johnson. Yes. So I'm getting, from what my understanding, because I'm fielding a lot of calls because I am the uh, supervisor for this district, um, the site is not shutting down, correct? Correct. We are not shutting, we're not shutting it down. This budget reflects as if it reflects that all sites will be open when we can go back to COVID-19. The one thing that everybody has to understand about the winter site, we need more support from the people in winter. We need Meals on Wheels drivers. We need people to come to the site neat. We can't support a site that only has five or six people that come to eat lunch every day. Um, so no, we have no intentions of closing it. But as one of my board members said not too long ago, we need support from the winter area, not just a few people, but a lot of people. We need a good, strong advisory board like we have in Stone Lake, we have in Excellent, and we have in Hayward that really go out there and promote that site and get people to come there. Okay. Okay. I still have a couple. Sure. So, are you guys, are, are you going to do any um, meetings down there to try to gain some momentum for the people to come out? Because I, we know there has been issues at that site mm -hmm. and some of the people, you know, walked away. I told them that you're sabotaging yourself. If you do not go to the site, the site is going to end up shutting down. Um, 
I, I'm going to tell you right now, I will be a staunch advocate for that site not to shut down if that ever comes to, to, to head. Um, our community is already lacking no transportation out here for the elderly. We need to continue to service them with meals. We are very uh, low income, poverty stricken down in the southern end, and those elderly need their meals. If there is somehow to, uh, I know it's, you know, you're getting the money for the Senior Resource Center, but somehow if within the county or somehow revamp that site where it could offer also something for the uh, kids in the area, it, it might uh, help, help out with that situation because that is also lacking down here. Right. I'm just throwing some ideas out there so that sure. site can remain open. Right. Um, in fact, last week, um, Brenda Adler met with um, Aaron Jones, the site manager, and they have a list of names of people that they're going to be contacting to start a new advisory board. And I talked to Brenda after she met with Aaron, and I had met with Aaron earlier in the week. We had done, we had um, Barb Appleby and I, who was the nutrition director, we had gone to each one of the sites and did a, a site visit and talked with all the site managers um, to alert them to and talk about some of the things that they needed to bring to our site managers meeting on this Thursday and talked about that advisory board. So Brenda Adler is going to be working with Aaron to get that committee together, but it probably won't set a meeting up until after our site managers meeting this Thursday. So I would look in the next week or two for a notice to come out inviting people to a uh, meeting at the senior center. One of the things that I caution both Aaron and Brenda about is don't get a meeting going with um, 20 or 25 people. Start out with five to eight people and then work from there. But they are working on that, Dawn. And if it's okay with you, I will pass your name on to Brenda Adler. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. I will. Thank you, Joey, for your, your job. And you You're welcome. Doing the best you possibly can. Thank you. Okay. Now we have the budget review for the Senior Research Center. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Can you make a comment? Briefly, yes. When uh, Luke Pratt was running the center, it seemed like there was a lot more people attending. Also, it seemed like the food was a lot better. And that might be part of the drop you know, of attendance there. I am a former member of the Senior Resource Center Board, and there was a lot of things happening at the time. Uh, it wasn't just any one person or any two, three, four people. There was there was a lot happening, and there were probably a lot of mistakes made on both sides of the issue. So but it didn't it, seem like there was a lot more people at the time, you know, coming in. There were, there were. Uh, Unfortunately, right now. Um, Excuse me, who is speaking? Arlene. Okay. Unfortunately, right now, there are people, there are a lot of people, we lost like about 10 people with the COVID because they were told they could not meet at the site to pick up their lunch. They had to go on the road. And they, but it's easier for me to pick up my meal than it is for somebody to deliver because of the where they're located at to find them. Okay. One other thing too, uh, they said that excuse the, uh, me, excuse me. Uh, I want to get the board involved in on this. Does the board have any comments on the budget review of the request from the senior resource center? Um, yeah. No, the uh, the request that um, Ms. Johnson put in is in the budget currently, uh, so it's the same amount as last year, and that is in the operating budget currently. Yes. And that is proposed at the full operation of all the facilities, of all of their sites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatever she had proposed. Yeah, I think part of the consternation came uh, in her budget document where she had a, a bullet point in there about um, you know closing, but I think she clarified that. Um, for their statements this evening as far as the operation of those two sites. 
So now I can- Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Mr. Hoff, do we also have that appropriated amount for that ban, the 8521 grant and that ban? What is our responsibility, 15,000 or something? Yeah, 15,978. And that's currently in the budget? Did you just get that number, Joey, or, or was that submitted with your request? This is Joey. Tom, I just got that today. Carol um, sent me the workbook and it was the numbers were in there today. So I just received those numbers today. I think what Rose put in there was exactly a little bit more than last year's. So she put um, 86867 in the budget and it actually is going to be this year with the increase 95867. So there is a little bit of an increase like not quite um, $10,000, so nine something difference or so from what we had in there. Okay, so you can get with Mike Keith tomorrow and just make sure that uh, he's got the appropriate numbers in there? Sure, I will give, I'll talk to Mike tomorrow and give him those numbers. Okay, then we should be good. <clears throat> and regularly dispatch this on to you and Mike. Yes. Okay. Um, is there any further comments about the budget? Well, Tom, is this Senior Resource Center budget included in the Health and Human Services budget, or is it separate? Uh, it's, it's it's its own line item. The uh, money you contribute to the Senior Resource Center, and, you know, there is some overlap um, you know, with the ADRC, um, the functions they provide that way, but it, it's a separate budget for them. Okay. Okay. Let's move on then. Child Protective Services. That's me. That's the Rice. I'm the director for the Child Welfare and Family Services at LCO. Um, so, Tweed had asked me to come to this meeting as there was some concerns about the placement um i guess how you would say what our policy is or how we go about deciding how to place and when to place and how long to keep in place um our process is that we assess safety throughout the entire time that we interact with the families so from the beginning when a child protective services report is made we're already assessing safety of the home we do that over the next up to the next 60 days deciding whether or not a child is safe if at any time we decide that the child's not safe we try to prevent removal as much as we can um, we know that removing children is traumatic for them um, it also carries a um, historical trauma piece that's unique to our tribe of families so we do try to prevent removal but when we decide that we can't keep the child safely at home we've tried protective plans and things like that um, where we try to minimize what the children are experiencing when that fails we do have to make a decision where the children should go our first option is always within their own families however what we find in some families is that the children can't be kept safely there either either family is not available or they also have addiction or abuse issues or things that are in the background check that are not going to allow us to place the child. <clears throat> so then we also, then we look at what is available for foster care. And foster care, we have one home license at LCO. Um, we're trying to increase that. However, it is a um, big undertaking and not a lot of people want to do it. So. When that happens, we do place in our own home. We will utilize their county homes. We do try to look outside of our other <clears throat> areas, like we try other tribes to see if they have homes available or other counties. But we find that there's a shortage everywhere. So also, when they're in foster care, sometimes the children um, have more needs than can be met in a regular foster home. So for example, um, treatment foster care would be our next level, our next option. So they get more, the foster parents have more training. They should be able to handle some of the kids' behaviors a little bit um, better than a regular foster home would. And then sometimes, even in that home, the children's behaviors can't be contained or we can't manage them. And we're always looking at safety for them and also for other children that may be in that home too. 
So then we have to go up a level. We look at group homes. So there's 24 hour wait staff there. Um, they get programming there. They get you know mental health, behavioral health services are in place at the group homes. Sometimes in the saddest ones are the ones that end up in residential care. These are the children that have more severe behavioral disturbances. Um, we don't place there lightly. We also monitor them. Throughout this process, we also follow the CANS assessment, which is a child and adolescent needs and strength system that sets the foster care rating and also determines, helps us, helps us determine what the level of care is. So it's basically the same process that Florida County follows when deciding when children should be there. Every six months, the children have to have a new CANS assessment done to see if there's been improvements made. Um, we look at when we can get kids um, either into permanent homes or um, are they, can they be moved into a less restrictive? We also look at the effect that moving kids has on them. So multiple placements is something that we try to avoid too. Um, we don't, that's basically what we do. We're not trying to keep kids in um, care longer than they need to be. We're also um, paying attention to our tribal families and what um, the effects of things like termination of parental rights have. So historically speaking, that's something that happened a lot to Native people and that has created a long, long history and future of, you know, just dis disrupted parenting and it really does affect our children and families. So that's why some of our placements are longer. Each case is different. Um, sometimes we are able to find, you know, somebody that will adopt a child and sometimes it works out. Sometimes we are really working with the family to try to reunify. So we don't just enter it lightly. We really do assess throughout the entire time what their needs are. So I'm not sure like if there's any other questions that the board has for Indian Child Welfare as far as placement goes. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your presence. I want to be perfectly clear, this board was not protesting anything, any wrongdoing. I think we were just curious, weren't we just clear? Well, yeah, and I was great very good board to get some. I was just concerned that I know a push for the tribal member children is that we be they be raised on a reservation and we have tribal families. And I know the issue there with our foster care uh, placement, very few foster homes, and we were gonna work on that number. But we were just concerned with these kids being moved off the reservation and placed in these other like the the residential care centers and group homes that they weren't on the reservation or were they with tribal members. So that was our concern. And I didn't realize you were reassessing them every six months. Is that right, Tavissa? Yeah. And what does CAMP stand for again? Child and Adolescent Needs and Strength. Yeah. I got another question for you. What is yep. the difference? I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? Nope. What is the difference between a group home and residential care? It's the, um, what they serve, like group homes are, it's a less restrictive six-star setting. It's unlock doors, can't, well, I don't know, do they lock them from the outside at night? Yeah, probably, they have to. Mm -hmm. um, residential care is a lot of the times what they'll do there is they have like on-site psychiatric assessments and things like that, group homes don't. Um, but so, group homes have that? Available somebody from they, they would go out to the community providers. So, like, we do have non left oasis here. They take mail. So, no females can go there, just males are the only ones that they provide care services to. So, the boys that are at Northwest Oasis go to community providers for like mental health and things like that. Mm -hmm. Residential care, they're on site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Carla Kay had her hand up to speak. I'm sorry. Carla, go ahead, please. Yeah. All right, there you go. Can you hear me, Carla? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure you knew I was here. I presented last month. I have nothing to add, but I'm here for questions if needed. Thank you. Tourism mother, are there any tribal dollars that are allocated to these kids that are put into residential care centers or group homes off the reservation? No, they're not. Um, they, the dollars that they would be able to get would be coming, we'd have to apply for something called high cost homes. 
And that's like a joint application that Carla and I would do and we have done to try to mitigate some of those costs because those are expensive places. Right. But travel dollars don't technically go in there. Um, the high cost pool, uh, you have to wait till the year is over. And then you have to um, go in and do an application and you're with every other pony. And it's uh, proving only RCC and group home costs, so the therapeutic or foster care costs don't count. Right. And you get a percentage based on how much you spent in the year for how much you were against every other pony. So I think the highest we've ever gotten is, uh, I think it was $50,000 for all the kids for the entire year when, when an RCC runs anywhere from ten to $12,000 a month. So just so, I mean. So you're not saying it's not worth chasing that money, are you? No, not at all. No, we do. No, well, we, we do. do. We, yeah, we, we do. apply for it every year. I'm just trying to get. say uh, how much it is and what it is. Yeah. yeah. We misunderstand. misunderstand. No. Oh, no. No, they apply and, and they get Probably. something. But it can range anywhere from like three, dollars $4,000 to, you know, I mean, it's not like they're going to pay for an entire child or, or all your costs or anything like that. No, but you don't know what you're going to get. It's, it's part of the revenue stream that you have yep. to pay for. Yep. Okay, thank Definitely. You. Yes. Um, this one. Are we still working on foster care licensing in the We are. We actually hired a foster care coordinator who started last week. Um, however, there is a lot of training that she's going to need to be able to do her job. For example, when we license foster homes, we use the state home study, which is the same home study that the counties, all of the Wisconsin counties use. So it's going to be a matter of getting her trained in that before she can finally start doing that. Also fingerprinting. Um, the tribe has, we have something called the TAP program, it's the tribal access program, that allows us to do our own fingerprint background checks. However, Somebody has to be certified on that. And I think I have two, three staff that are trying to get certified on it so we can move forward with licensing. Um, that does not really change what we're gonna be able to do as far as like, you know, like the cost of placement. Because once we license the foster home, they're still gonna be paid foster care money. Mm -hmm. What we try to do at LCO is we try to um, utilize the kinship care program. Mm -hmm. That has restraints on it in that, um, we have to abide by the federal definition of family, which allows us only to go up to second cousin for placement. Anybody in your family beyond that would have to be a licensed foster placement. So even if we are able to license all these different homes, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change what we're able to do as far as placing kids in them. It might open it up for, you know, when we're able to step people down into a lesser level of care. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on this issue? I would like to make a comment. Um, I understand there's there's unique challenges with some of the kids that you place, and I just my background is, is a therapist, a licensed clinical social worker, mental health, all that kind of stuff. And I back in my younger days, I worked I worked at RCCs. I worked as a therapist that, that coordinated with RCCs. And my concern is, I mean, they may just looking at this right away, these are lengthy, these are lengthy stays. I know in RCCs, and I've been I've been out of the loop for a lot of years doing this stuff, but I know that it was, you know, a, a year or more was, was was quite a bit. And I know the on, the ongoing conversations would all would be with with the agency that placed the kid, the therapist involved, and the RCC would always be having a, a, a fluid conversation about what's the plan for this kid so this doesn't become a way of life that they stay in. There. And I know you're so I just I just I hope those conversations are going on because I know RCCs, if you don't push them, they'll keep they'll find a way to keep the kid there. I mean, I just it's it's they it just will. It's a business. So yeah, for what it's worth. Yeah, we do we are looking at that. We do have um I think two that we want to transition back into care with their mother as soon as they're able to like get regulated with their medications and things that they need. One of them is um, he he's pretty unique. I think he's got a lot of challenges and he's had those challenges for a very long time. 
So finding him, oh, finding the time for him to stabilize happens, but he can only like maintain for I think 21 days at the longest. And that's been historically throughout his entire placement. So it's trying to figure out what we can do for him to help him. And then also just a unique situation as far as family goes, there isn't one available for him. So he's one that's gonna need an adoption. And that's gonna be very challenging for us. Right, and for two the RCC should be working with from a placement like the help transition. Otherwise, because you can get kids stabilized in an RCC and they're doing fine, but then what are you doing when you leave? And that's that's where the real work comes in. So again, it's been a while since I've been involved in the whole process, but if you just uh, got some of the cobwebs out think when I saw these lengthy stages. So thank you. Can where are these residential care centers located? Um, none are very close to here. I think the closest we have would be um, in Frederick. Our kids are all in Hill Capital right now. I think all of them are. They're all at the same residential facility. Yeah. So, so it's very difficult for families to visit. I mean, it is. We do like offer transportation. Like if we, because we try to go down at least once a quarter and try every month, but that doesn't work right now. Um, COVID's really affected our ability to do that. The kids typically come home for home visits if there's an identified family um, or somebody like that. We try to get them home at least for like holidays or whenever it is appropriate for them so they're having that contact. Um, and the one thing that, that I can say is like this has worked out for the kids. They all know that they're from LCO. They do get to see each other. So they talk about stuff. They actually have a therapist there that is, I think he's from Black Lives Lambo. And actually he's a psychiatrist. But yeah, he, he does talk with the kids about their culture and stuff like that. So they are getting that piece in there. Our workers are always looking at different ways to make sure that the kids stay connected to home. Um, we're looking at bringing and buying them maps because we talked about it when we go to visit them. And the kids can say, hey, they look on a map because they're dropping books. And they say, this is, this is where my family is at. And they can point out the different keys that they're from. Well, they're connected. So who does the CANS assessment every six months down? Is it one of well, our you, workers do? You guys do. And are you including what Paul was talking about? I mean, working with that residential care center to get them to the next step or move them on? The residential facility that the kids are at, um, not all the kids on the list are mine, but I can speak, I know that they release bi-weekly treatment plans for all of the kids so we are meeting bi-weekly with um, their team there the doctor and the therapist and then their work caseworker that they have there um, and then in terms of visits we were transporting parents and family members and we would go down for our visits um, or arranging for vouchers for that to happen since covid we have been doing them by zoom and I believe almost nearly all of them are having weekly visits via Zoom with family members. And I, three of them are in process now, transitioning out of residential care. No, I appreciate it. No. Let's move on to public health, coronavirus update. Julia is online. Uh, yeah, I just got you in there. Can you hear me, Julia? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay. Please go ahead. So I'll is this a little better? I'll hold the phone a little closer. Okay, so um, I actually have a good update tonight. Um, things are starting to look a little bit better. And um, Alex, if you can go on to the next slide. Um, as we look at, um, whoops, there we go. As we look at um, our cumulative cases since um, the beginning of COVID, we have 166 positives. Um, and now seven of our positive cases have been hospitalized for 24 hours or more. Um, currently we have 60 suspects and 400, 104,000, excuse me, 111 
people have tested negative. So we have many more negative tests than that. Um, and we are just starting to be able to get in to do some data diving in that. Next month, I should be able to tell you how many tests have totally been performed. Um, but this is the number of people who have tested negative in Sawyer County. And this graph here comes from Harvard Global Health. It looks at a seven day moving average. Um, and when we were at our all time high, we were about 38 cases per day per 100,000 people. And um, as of Sunday, we were down to six, um, which is amazing that we have been able to come down this quickly. Uh, so I think everybody um, really encouraging that safer at home, um, not practicing um, what, um, behaviors like we used to live in um, and going back to being a bit safer has really helped. So um, it's looking good right now. It's a great way to start the school year. Next slide. Uh, this data reflects two weeks of data and unfortunately it gets updated on a Wednesday, which will be tomorrow. So it's fairly old. But um, I just wanted to be able to bring up, this is what the state represents. And uh, they, again, they look at two weeks of data. Um, and um, we were considered at a high burden at that time. But the nice thing is, is this also shows that our, ten, our trend and our trajectory is going lower. Um, so it, it, even though it's older data, it does mesh with what we're seeing on Harvard. I use the Harvard data because it's the most recent seven days. It gets updated um, every two days. And so it, it allows us to get a cleaner picture of where we're at. Next slide, please. And this is just to give you um, a census tract view. And you can see where we are most densely populated is where we have had the most number of cases. And then you can just see um, the surrounding counties where we're at. Next slide. Wanted to give you a few next steps on where we're at and what our goals are. And our number one goal is to keep students in school. Um, been working very closely with the superintendents and those that um, are responsible for the health of students in the schools. Um, I meet with the superintendents every Tuesday, and um, the superintendents join me for the call on Wednesday, along with um, the health people that would be working on the, with the health of students. Um, what we're working on right now is actually being able to do swabbing um, and testing in the schools. Um, one of the things that you may hear about on the news is that there is antigen testing and then there's PCR testing. Um, and PCR or molecular testing is the same thing. And that is what um, LCO is using when they do their rapids and also what um, Hayward Hospital has recently gotten. Antigen testing is um, not as sensitive and it is, um, it actually works kind of like a pregnancy test, although you use a nasal swab and not urine. And um, that, those test kits may be, are, are going to be available to schools. Um, however, I am actually more interested in working with LCO and um, the hospital to be able to get the nasal swabs to them because those, swab, those uh, test kits are, are test level is more accurate um, and it is still rapid and can be turned around in the same day. So we'll be getting that up and running hopefully by the end of next week. I'm waiting on a couple of things from the state to help me get up and running um, when it comes to um, MOUs and um, informed consent in a few of those things, but they're, they're getting really close to that. The next thing that we're really focused in on is influenza clinics. Um, I'll be pulling together a group of um, people in the community that already um, are vaccinating for influenza or want to vaccinate for influenza so that we have a county um, vaccination plan. We do want to get vaccinations for influenza by um, mid-October at the latest and, um, and get moving on that so that we have 
that protection from influenza and we're not seeing both influenza and COVID in our community. For contact tracing, we've hired and onboarded four limited term employees. They work part time. They um, either have another job or are retired and wanting to come on and help support us. So uh, they just uh, followed their first few cases over the weekend. And then the other big thing that we're focused in on is communication. Our website's been updated. We're going to continue to grow the content in that. And then Facebook's being updated daily by our new volunteer public information officer. So um, things, are, things are looking good on the COVID front as far as our numbers right now. Um, and we will hope that we don't see any fallout from um, Labor Day weekend. We would start to see that by midweek uh, next week, if that's the case. Any questions for me? With um, the contact tracing, mm -hmm. um, I know there's been difficult times trying to contact people because of the no phone or not mm -hmm. have information or whatever. I just would like to encourage you to work closely with our clinic staff. We have a team too that have been working mm -hmm. together to, to work closer with the county when you are tracing and and um, pulling our forces together to keep addressing that COVID virus. So that communication. Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Do you have more, Lorraine? Yeah. So I wanted to, I, I, we actually work very closely with the health center and I, I'll just fill you in on how we do that. We, um, um, from one of the grants with LCO, one of our contact tracers is actually working through LCO. And then Linda Briggs um, is um, the COVID coordinator for the health clinic. And um, actually we are on phone calls with them um, Monday through Thursday, if not Friday, if things are crazy. So we are communicating and actually um, working together. And when we do have difficulty reaching people, the health center does um, send somebody out. So, um, so you're, uh, we've had excellent, excellent support from the LCO health, health center. It's been a good working relationship. Have we had any deaths in our county yet? Um, we are we we are just going to be. There is a death that happened. We are validating um, that it was COVID related, and if it is, that will be reported out tomorrow. So that is all I can give you right now. We're looking at medical records. I think it's important. But we, when you um, or when we get the information out to the community, um, to not lose sight of the severity of this coronavirus, because some have kind of downplayed it and don't realize how serious it is. So when we keep getting getting those messages out there, keep getting that, that's a good thing because we're we keep reminding the people of the serious mm -hmm. and the the safety measures that we need to have in place. So. I just wanted to keep encouraging that because um, there's times that it gets to be confusing and people don't know what to do at what stage or what point or how, you know, they, they're afraid or they get anxiety. I mean, all kinds of things happen. And um, uh -huh. I just think it's really important to keep sending information out. We will keep working on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Julia, this is Tweed. Have we, yeah. um, have any recent COVID cases been linked back to the Sort of Funny Fair? No, they have not. Okay, great. That's my quick, that's my quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're concerned. We're going to catch up about having that. Um, and then these, yeah. the seven or so that have been hospitalized, and I'm looking at you, Dr. Two, have they been in the Hayward Hospital and on ventilators? Or? We have not kept anybody at the neighborhood hospital at this point. Excellent. And what is there a medication now that's kind of rose to the there's a couple of the there's line a, that's well there are a couple that are have potential use, but nothing is a miracle here for sure. All right. Okay. 
Julia, good evening. Good evening. I have a two parter. I'm trying to figure out if you test positive within the community, how I have information that someone had tested positive and then was out uh, at several of the bars within Hayward and is a hospice nurse and is still working. So I don't know how I get that information to somebody. So that would be good just to call the health department and we can and you can share that with us. 634-4806 because this is definitely a, a conversation to have offline. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I, I figured that. I was just, my other thing is, as I said, when I was out in the community this weekend, and in fact, I'm trying to figure out what within the county even though we have the masking order from governor evers and obviously the police are not enforcing it which i understand um what are the businesses to be doing are they supposed to be requiring them you know they have signs on the door that say requiring to wear masks but it seems to be that the almighty dollar took precedence over the health of our local citizens this weekend or this holiday. And I was very disappointed because I, I, like I said, I see many, many license plates from Arizona, Minnesota, Illinois, New Jersey, Florida, I, the list could go on. And uh, I happened to be in a pit stop uh not one person coming in the door except the locals had a mask on and then they proceeded to try to say that they had a girl that worked there that couldn't wear a mask and that's why they weren't requiring people that were coming in to wear them because she couldn't wear them and i looked at the girl and said do you understand the reason why the people should be wearing masks that are coming in here is because she's she's suppressed so I'm confused, it, like at the local gas station, again, go in, all locals have the mask on, all visitors do not. And I asked the gas station, why do you have the sign on the door if you're not going to require it? Uh, and I'm trying to figure it out because that's where I'm concerned about with what I saw out over the weekend. I agree, it's frustrating. Um, and I wish we had the manpower to help um, really enforce that a little bit closer. We are going to be working, um, we do have somebody going out and talking with businesses right now. Um, we did not have anybody going out over the weekend looking at things. So it's unfortunate to hear that so many people were not masking. Um, a lot of times visitors tend to, can tend to be a little bit better than some of us because we let our guard down. So um, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. And I think that's lesson learned for me the next time we have um, a big weekend like that to get an advisory out as a reminder for travel. When you're coming into our community, you should be masking. Okay. Thank you, Don, for sharing that. Thanks, Julia. Any further comments, questions, or questions, we'll leave this a good time to move into the residential. The ordinance, I should say. Sure, yeah. Um, before you is an update for the public health ordinance. Um, Sawyer County has an existing public health ordinance uh, on the books. Uh, and we, we had a revision that we brought to the board uh, a couple, three months ago and then pulled it back um, because there was some uh, guidance that was being put together by the Wisconsin Counties Association. So the Wisconsin Counties Association uh, had a, a task force to look into the issues 
uh, that arose after the Palm Supreme Court case uh, and the governor's uh, first order, uh, the Safe Heart Home order, and how that was uh, went through the court system uh, and, and kind of uh, changed the way we look at things. So the state public health officer is, of course, uh, guided by state statute. The local health officer, the health officer we have here in Sawyer County, uh, gets her authority from a different state statute. Uh, so they're, they're in the same section, but they're, they're different statutes and their authority is a little bit different. However, after the Palm case came out, which kind of uh, limited the ability of, of her to put out an order, order without legislative oversight, uh, the question kind of arose, can a local health officer uh, have more authority than, than the state official? And so uh, as, as they started to look at things, they came to the conclusion that perhaps uh, we should update our local ordinance uh, to include uh, what we learned after, after that uh, happened earlier this year. So the uh, update before you uh, has some changes in it. And now this has also gone through public safety. And so the red line version of the ordinance you have includes the changes that were suggested by public safety as they looked at it. So as the health uh, board, you can take a look at the ordinance, put in your own suggestions, comments, um, have a discussion about what you like to see in this ordinance from a policy perspective that may or may not um, limit the local health officer's authority to, not, their, not her authority, but how that uh, order is enforced. Her authority to, to do a local order comes from statute. Uh, what came into uh, question was how does that get enforced? And so the ordinance deals with the enforcement aspect of a local health order. You realize that the, the governor has an order out now, or the state has an order out, uh, which expires at the end of September. Um, if that expires and the local health officer needs to take an action or do an order uh, on the local level, um, she has the authority to do that, but what does the enforcement look at? Um, so that's kind of the general background. We do have Rebecca Wolker, our, our legal uh, uh, counselor on the line as well to help go over some of the finer points of the ordinance and, and maybe detail some of the uh, other changes in the ordinance that are being contemplated to be revised. Um, and then you can have a discussion about, you know, if that's uh, the policy that you want to do or have, you know, a discussion about that. So uh, if it's okay with the chair, the Rebecca, uh, do you have any uh, further comments or uh, introductory comments about the changes being contemplated here? We don't hear you yet if we talk. Is she unmuted? Can you hear me? There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear that you had questions. <laughs> Didn't have questions yet. Just wondering if you had any other introductory comments. Uh. Oh, um, no, actually, Tom did a great job summarizing. Um, so happy to answer any questions if you have them. Yeah, Rebecca, this is Tweed. Um, Hi, Tweed. So Rebecca, do you concur with these, um, the red lines that the public safety has added? You've had time to look at these and Agree or? Yeah, I do. I think that what they were looking for, um, you know, was clarification of certain points. Um, let me just get back to my draft here. Um, you know, there's nothing that is a, um, you know, a material change. Um, you know, from the original intent um, of the ordinance that I as was provided to public safety. Um, you know, there was some clarification in terms of, you know, the involvement of law enforcement and that it's really a, a partnership effort, um, which I think that's, you know, that's certainly fine. Um, it's, you know, so long as both the public health officer and the sheriff are acting within their statutory authority, um, which is an inherent requirement. Um, so yeah, I think these, I think these revisions are, are fine if this is the policy direction that the county would like to go. So 
So like Rebecca on the first red line, um, it talks about the ordinance is adopted and shall be administered by the Sawyer County Department of Health and Human Services. That department or like the health officer and the Sawyer County Sheriff within each discretion. So they could both have two different opinions on enforcement or administration of this order? Yeah, they could. Um, so one of the one of the comments, um, you know, from public safety was that it um, it wanted to, you know, have a balanced um, enforcement, um, you know, between the public health officer um, and the sheriff's department in law enforcement. And so that is why we added, um, you know, the the reference to the sh the Sawyer County Sheriff um, with respect to you know, we can, with respect to the reference to the Department of Health, um, we can amend that to say um, the, uh, it's administered by the public health officer or his or her designee, um, simply because you want the public health officer staff to be able to do, um, you know, what their jobs are as well. Um, you know, the actual issuance of a citation um, or any other official action um, should be, you know, pursuant to what the ordinance requires. Um, I just don't want to tie the county's hands by making it too narrow um, in terms of the actual administration of the ordinance. That would be my recommendation. Well, well Doug is here and I respect him a lot. Uh, we're gonna, that's kind of worded wrong though, I think, Rebecca. I think you need to put somewhere in there the Health and Human Services Officer and the Surrey County Sheriff. I mean, if we're gonna put them both on an equal level here, um, no offense, no offense to Doug, but that we are talking about communicable disease and public human health hazards. So a public health nurse or officer, you know, is gonna have a lot more education in that area. And correct me, Dr. Dunlap, than our good sheriff, Mr. Morotek, who's very good at what he does. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a that's a tough call to give them both authority. I mean, I think they should work together. Well, go ahead, Dr. Well, I'm actually wondering if that allows you to say that you don't agree. Is that what I'm reading? That it says that if you don't agree with what the public health officer wants to do, it's your discretion. Well, but if I may, there's a couple points I'd, I'd like to share. There was some very healthy discussion at, at public safety, I'll bet. And uh, I, I know Supervisor Van Etten had mentioned that he had some concern about elected officials being involved in the process. And I'm not certain whether in totality it was on the legislative side establishing the ordinance or elected officials on the enforcement side and uh, the opportunity wasn't made to happen to clarify some of those things. But I think Tweed, you bring up a valid point. And from my perspective, I think when it comes to elected officials establishing an ordinance, that's their role and, that, and that's better process, better government. As far as on the enforcement side, I think it's best if your department heads are responsible, just like your zoning department head takes care of the zoning ordinances, land and water take and are part of enforcing that highway has a few ordinances they enforce. We will, we're more than happy to work collaboratively with them, whatever they need, we're 24 seven. But when it comes down to that final decision of enforcement, issuing that civil forfeiture and, and submitting it to the prosecuting attorney, I really think that's their expertise of knowledge and is much better done in that department. Very similar to a, a city government having a chief of police, the city government establishes that ordinance, that one department head and their staff is responsible for enforcing that. For law enforcement to have that broad perspective and knowledge of all these different agency and department enforcements, is asking for a lot and I don't think it's going to benefit 
the county or Sawyer County in this case better. And I would like to see on the enforcement side, the Sheriff's Department taken out of that and giving it to the health officer for the enforcement role of it under the county board's direction of establishing the ordinance. I think that's best process. And it, it brings the elected officials in as far as what the department head has or if it's ordinances relative to us to enforce on the law enforcement side, our ring of expertise, they're the legislators, they established the ordinance and we're happy to enforce it. I think that's, that's much better process. I am not in favor of including the sheriff's office in enforcement. I think Tweed, you bring up a very valid point. We could have an indifference of opinion what it means, right. and that's not our expertise on the health side. I, we, I'm not comfortable as the department head here having our people be one of the primary enforcement as well. I think that should go back to the department head with the expertise. Well, I'd agree, and I appreciate that. Doug, I think it's kind of out of your realm a little bit to make that decision. And that's why I'm here tonight, because I'm not comfortable with the red line change. I like it the way it was I before it better. Um, I, I get it. the perspective with county board members, um, you know, wanting elected officials having their input, but I, I, I would rather see when it comes to the enforcement, you know, that going to that department head once the ordinance is established and and let the, the board in process establish the ordinance according. It, it, it really adds to consistency and, and knowledge in that arena and, and serving the county better. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna ask if Julia was still here and if she had an opinion. Yep. Yep, I am, and I was just waiting for that time. <laughs> I just, um, I, I, I agree actually with the sheriff because we've talked through some of these things already with um, COVID and and even trying to figure out um, in the beginning when um, we had safer at home and and how do we work through some of these things. Um, we've been working very closely with law enforcement and should we need support to go out to enforce an order. Um, I have faith that we will get um, support from the sheriff and any deputies that we would need assistance from. So um, we, we have a very good working relationship. I know that we're not going to be out in the cold um, as we move forward with this. Uh, Julia, you can't be okay with that red line. No, I agree with the sheriff on the, the red. I don't think that I think it causes issues when the sheriff and I have to go back and forth on who who understands the what the ordinance should be. So it without that first red line, that would be good. Great. So do you have that worded? A I'm sorry, Chairman. Do you have that worded a different way than Rebecca or Julia? Uh, uh, can I just ask a quick question? Um, yeah, I mean, however you want me to revise this, I'm happy to do so. Um, you know, these red lines were taken, um, you know, based on the direction from um, public safety and then from the, you know, follow-up conversation. Um, so any changes, if you want me to strike that first sentence under authority, I'm, I think that's fine to do so. Um, again, any if there are revisions that I think create a legal issue, I will certainly tell you that. Um, but otherwise, just let me know what you want me to strike and I can do that. Or if you have questions regarding the legal impact of, of striking certain things, um, I'm happy to answer that. But, you know, from a legal perspective, there's no requirement that that addition be included in authority. That was just a marching order from public safety in a okay. subsequent discussion. Um, and this, this is Julia again. Sorry, did anybody else have anything with that that they want to say um, to keep that in there just so that we're hearing both sides? It doesn't look like it, Julia. I have a question. Okay. Just, in, uh, Chair, so in the past, the sheriff's departments must have had a lot of occasion to work with zoning 
to help zoning enforce a zoning ordinance with a, let's say, a particularly obstructive tenant or owner of property, you guys jumped in with a little bit of help, right? We, we have, and, and currently with the Tiger Cat Dam, we have worked with zoning a lot on regulations there, and some of it does fall in our court trespassing, and then we take the enforcement role of that. Probably one of the arenas that we've helped the most and referred cases to is the health officer, especially you know with some of these, uh, um, well, and these short-term rentals, you know, noise complaints in the middle of the night, we're on, we'll take the complaint and get with their staff the next day and deal with it together. And then they do the enforcement part of it. And they have the leverage too, because they issue the license. So they have that leverage over their head as well to the landowner. So, and it, it falls in their arena and it's worked very well. Um, they, they don't have to come out or deal with it um, outside of the hours they work. And, and we can turn a report over to them and we'll even respond or go with them and help them. But the actual decision on enforcement matters or how they're going to try to gain voluntary compliance falls back to that department head. So we have a good history of a system that is working. I think it's a general consensus here at this board that we should maintain that type of a system on this issue. Do we need a motion to say that to, uh, and then pass that on to the county board. Is that I, I still have to oh, discuss it. Yeah. Okay. That's I'm fine, Chuck. I'm waiting to hear that. Yeah. I just wanted to ask what, what would be. Yeah. The way we handled this in, in public safety is we, you know, kind of generated this kind of discussion and you came to a consensus on what you wanted to see in that. And then uh, Rebecca would draft that so that it's legally okay. But, but your ideas here can be put into the document and then we'll. Uh, if this gets passed to the county board, then we'll probably include a blue line, you know, that the health department suggestions, and then as the full board gets together, you can decide as a whole board what you want to do. Thank you. I just wanted to know the procedure, Chuck. I didn't even cut you off. I didn't see you down there. Please, uh, what did you have to say? The question first is to Tom. Um, you said that, and you said this in the public safety one also, that the county health nurse gets her authority through state statute. Yeah. So if that's the case, why are we even having this discussion? Why do we need to update a county ordinance? Why, if, if her authority is coming from the state, then why are we trying to adapt this? And it's it's more on the enforcement end of it. Uh, this ordinance uh, in the revision puts in uh, the, the penalties and the citation ability. You know, if, if there is non-compliance. And so it's the enforceability of a local health officer's uh, order uh, that, that kind of came into question after the Palm case. Um, Rebecca, did I state that properly or is there other comments you can put on that? No, that's correct. So as we look at, you know, part of it, you know, as you look at like 1.3, uh, you know, the abatement of communicable diseases and uh, the order and the enforceability. Um, you know, there's a couple of points in 1.3b that talk about, you know, this is the other end of the um, uh, oversight as well by elected officials. So duly Alliance has the authority by statute to do an order. Um, and that order becomes binding when she makes that order. However, this ordinance would state, okay, the county board can still get together and say, uh, you know, that's that's overboard and we want that rescinded. Uh, and if, if the county board doesn't, then that order uh, is still enforceable. But it gives the, the county board, the elected officials, the opportunity, um, you know, to, to have some control over that authority um, from the local health officer. So if there is an order and it is a, a valid order according to the board, uh, how does that get enforced. And so then uh, you look towards the ordinance, you know, at the end where it talks about the enforcement and the uh, penalties thereof, and those penalties come into play by this ordinance. And if, if this ordinance didn't have that, there would be no way uh, to enforce, you know, if a uh, business or whatever is, is not complying, 
for whatever reason or a person. Um, you know, these are, this is more of a global. It's not just a, a one business kind of thing. It's just like uh, the, the whole community has got to abide by this rule. So um, it is, again, the enforceability. So after this, was it September 30th? Yes. So after September 30th, she then no longer has she any authority from the state? No, she always has that authority. Uh, the, the question is whether you would need to put something else in place once the state order uh, expired. So right now there is a state order uh, for mask. So everyone's got the mask. So at the end of September, if that's not extended and there is no masking order and the local health officer thinks that that still needs to happen and wants to do a local order because there is no state binding order at that point, she has the authority to, to do that at any time. So she but could do she, she may have the authority, but then she doesn't have the ability to follow through with it. I mean, she can, anybody can say anything and say, well, I am making this a rule. I want everybody to wear a mask. But once the state stops, if we don't do a warning, she can't, she can say it, she can't enforce it. That's my understanding, yes. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of work to this. I don't think we're ready to send it on yet. I, I know Dr. Dunlap, I'm sure, has more to add to this. Um, I think we're, you know, we're stripping the public health officer of a lot of <coughs> control here. And I know the county board probably wants to I read further on about rescinding some of these orders and taking back more control when we're not really the ed we're elected officials. We're not educated in communicable disease and public health hazards. So, you know, I'm not comfortable with, I'm not, Rebecca, if you can hear me, I'm not comfortable with some of these red lines. And I'd like to see, like Tom mentioned, the blue version you know, what is, what is Wisconsin County's proposal? Is that, is that what we have here in red line or is this just Story County public safety adding these red lines? Yes, it's the, it's public safety adding the red lines. Um, what we, or what I initially prepared for discussion purposes to go to public safety was um, not a, not a standard or example ordinance that WCA, WCA put out because WCA didn't do that. Um, we can't put out an example ordinance because it's too hard for every county to, um, you know, simply adopt an ordinance that's a sample. Um, so what we at WCA did is, you know, put together this guidance and put together points of consideration that are now all incorporated into Sawyer, County, Sawyer County's revised ordinance, which is obviously what you have in front of you, minus the red lines. The red lines um, reflect the conversation at public safety and then the follow-up conversation um, in terms of how the original draft that went to public safety should be modified. Um, I can tell you that the um, there are lots of counties um, throughout, well, there are a few counties throughout the state that we work with that are including um, provisions uh, regarding county board ratification of public health orders. Where things become questionable are the, the length of those public health orders. So for example, some counties had proposed um, using 30 days as the benchmark. So if a public health officer order was less than 30 days, it did not require ratification by the county board. And some counties feel that that is too much of a broad discretion to the public health officer. Um, so those are all policy points that the county can decide how it wants to structure county board oversight of the public health officer. Um, one thing I do think is important um, is that you have, you know, some in your ordinance, you have some connection between the public health officer decision or action, and then some act by the county board to either um, ratify or affirm it, or 
somehow put a legislative stamp of approval on it, if you will, because that's one of the issues that did come up in the Palm decision, you know, in terms of whether there's appropriate legislative authority or legislative oversight of the public health officer. Mr. Schumann, I don't know if that answers your question or if that was too long of a, too long of an answer. Um, I followed you part way there. What's that? I followed you part of the way there. But. Okay. I guess the easiest answer to, to your question is that the red lines reflect what public safety wanted to see. Um, they were not in the original draft and they're not, what you have in front of you was not a WCA sample um, because we didn't do a, a sample at WCA. But the ordinance incorporates what we put together at WCA for guidance. This is Julia. Can I, is it okay if I talk? I don't have a raise my hand thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schleicher. I, you know, with. Schleicher. Uh, uh, what, didn't I say Schleicher? <laughs> oh, no. I think I, I slurred. Um, so the, um, the original one, Rebecca, though, does have county board um, having uh, affirmation or a, the, even without the red line, there's still county board involvement. I oh, guess absolutely. that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, what, the, what was originally included um, was county board ratification of the public health officer order. Um, the, and essentially, the public health officer order um, under this section would not become effective until the county board gave it its stamp of approval. The, the red line changes that in that it sets forth um, this kind of ratification window. So if the board doesn't, if it fails to rescind the order within the 15 days, then certain things happen. Um, but Julie is correct that the original draft that went to public safety just had a requirement of ratification um, by county board um, before it would become effective. And again, that's the point that we at WCA feel is important because you want to have a legislative stamp of approval on that public health officer action if it is going to be enforced. Yeah, and I think part of the discussion there uh, was to change that language in 1.3. You know, if, if we're dealing with a public health uh, emergency that the uh, health officer has to do an order on, it must be something, uh, in her uh, opinion, in her expertise, is a serious thing that's happening. So, um, you know, rather than giving or having the board have to meet, uh, which could be a week or two or a month away, uh, that the order becomes effective immediately upon the order, but it could be rescinded by the board and they could meet, you know, in the next hour or within the next 15 days to rescind it if the board didn't agree with the health officer assessment. So it's just a matter of um, the uh, order of things that happen. You know, if it, if it is a serious offense or um, situation and the health officer wants to make that order, it becomes effective immediately the way that it's written down. And then the board would have to rescind it if they didn't like the order on a legislative level. But if they, so they could either meet to affirm it, and if they didn't meet at all, it becomes affirmed uh, by nature of not rescinding. That's the way it's written now. You can have any thought that you want on the matter yourselves and change that. Suggest it. Well, coming from the, the you know, the other meeting, my, my first thing is anything that came from that other meeting, it should just going to pull that back apart without their approval. So shouldn't we leave that the way it is, do a separate one, right. and then write this one. And my second thing is, if we, I don't think we should rush through this. Right. I think we're, we're a rush of a gray area. And that's what I have talked to the sheriff about me coming from law enforcement for 26 years. This is just, if this is, if she has the authority from the state, then let it be. 
we don't need to rectify or change anything and let the sheriff do what he does and let the county health person do what they do. I don't see that we need to ratify or change anything just because of the date coming up of September 30th. This takes a lot more discussions and if we've got two separate entities of uh, some of us are on that same board for public safety and 180 degrees different in the health and human and then that's going to be 180 degrees different from the full board. You, there's just so much here that can be discussed and talked about and changed and ratified. I'm not totally against one way or the other. I just think it, it needs to be more of a but I'm not happy with this one. I'm not happy with that one. I, I wouldn't want this to come to the board. There, I got more questions than I have answers. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Well, I wonder if we could do the same thing that public safety did. Public safety had this go to a group. Tom, Rebecca, most of only Tom. Just the chair of public safety. Jim, yeah. Tom, Rebecca, and Jim uh, work out a way to put these red lines in place that public safety wanted in place. We could do the same thing, have a smaller group of us put blue lines in place that we want in place. Uh, or we could just do nothing and say, we want more time to look this over and we'll take another crack at it next month. What is your well, I, I like the idea of, of getting a subgroup together and Tom and Rebecca and Dr. Dunlap. And even, I think I would want Julia's input on the health and human services side also. I mean, you put all these medical minds together and and expertise. I know there's going to be a different version coming to the full board, a health and human services version. Mm -hmm. So I would certainly, well, public safety, I would appreciate that. Yeah, public safety did lean toward the legal side so that certain words and phrases meant what everybody understood they would be. But we could certainly look at it also from the medical side. Tom, um, you want to speak? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, there's obviously a lot of opinions here um, on, on what this should be. And this is the reason that we brought it to, you know, two committees. Sometimes it, things only go to one committee, but it, it is an important issue. Uh, it's one we haven't dealt with uh, in our lifetime, obviously, dealing with these kinds of diseases. Um, and so your, your healthy discussion is warranted. I think, you know, this smaller group of, you know, Rebecca and myself and a couple other people, I mean, we're only here me being Rebecca and I to try and facilitate your thoughts. So, you know, you can put me in a room, but I we need your thoughts. So, I, I mean, I think you should continue this discussion and maybe go through some other things in here if you have any other ideas or thoughts on uh, things that you would like to see differently so that they could be incorporated in, with legalese, uh, with Rebecca's help. Um, you know, that, that's where I think we need uh, a little bit more discussion is to flush out your policy wishes so that it, they can be documented. You want to go through this line by line tonight? That's a <laughs> <up> few. <to> <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think I have no problem with that. We're going to be here for a while. Uh, I guess the alternative would be for each of us to read this study it carefully and if we do have a subgroup formed send our concerns to that subgroup before they meet and see what they can make it see if they can blue line it to something more favorable to this body either way it's fine i just got one more thing if, if I was going to have emergency surgery, I wouldn't want Doug assisted because that's not his forte. If if I'm going on a raid, I don't want to have the nurse assist me. These are two different entities that have, we're, we're trying to combine something, and I don't think we should. 
Yeah. But if I was going to have emergency surgery and the doctor was going to 50 miles away by a wreck, I'd want Doug to get that doctor at the hospital real quick. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the kind of cooperation we're looking at here. You know, Chuck is absolutely right, though. This should be from our committee. It's communicable disease and public human health. Um, I appreciate public safety giving us their input, and I appreciate Doug and Julia working so close together in coordinating everything. That's great. But this is actually in our realm. Um, because public safety did more than just lean well, they actually stepped over the line a few times. So I, I'd be all about that small group with uh, Dr. Dunlap and Julia, and I'd be happy also, and I'm with Lorraine, or any with Tom, you and Rebecca. Absolutely. I think we should do that and come up with a blue line version. And I don't, is this, Julia, is this time sensitive? Um, no, you know, if I needed to write an order, I could write an order, just like what we've already spoke about. It's the enforceability of it, and um, obviously, we're already struggling with enforceability on the state order, but it's because um, the way it's written and, and how, how we need to go about that. Um, it's the sooner the better, but um, I, I also, this is not just a COVID thing. So I do not want us to rush into something that, that everybody's not comfortable with bringing forward because this is something, you know, who knows what the next thing that comes into play could be. And so I want us to be very comfortable and not just think about COVID, but think about the long-term um, impact of this um, as we move forward. So, um, there is some time sensitivity to it, but again, um, I still have the authority to write an order if I need to. How was that for a roundabout answer? <laughs> Should we look at another option of calling a special meeting for the Human Services Board to specifically discuss this virtual line by line? Literally, what is your pleasure, people? Small group, small group. I mean, if you did a small group, you'd have to bring it back to the large group anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if we could do the small group and bring it back to this body next month. In the meantime, Julia could like to write her own ordinance. Is public safety is going to go back to full public safety? Or did we just. That's up to the did, did we just have to let the chair hang on? I think we had agreed that it came back to the full public. Yeah, if this, we weren't going to have time to get it to the board. Meeting before approval, so it's going to come back to public safety. I would have no problem with postponing for another month. We do nothing about that. If she can still enforce what she needs to, mm -hmm. we need to take our time and just yeah. give yeah. time for everybody to read this stuff yeah. and then come back next month and talk about it again. Is that a motion, John? I'd make that motion. I'll second it. Could you make that motion? So we can write it down. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 I make the motion that we table this discussion till the next meeting when we can meet again and talk about it. Okay. With the understanding that we're going to go through it more in more detail. That'll give everybody time to mm -hmm. do some research and talk. Chuck, are you okay with this small group though coming up with a blue line version? Like public safety did? That's fine. I mean, I don't think, I think we're still going to have the same discussions. Yeah. Whether we have a small group or big group. So it works. If it works for you, it works for me. Yep. And I would second that. Okay. The motion is to table this until the next full board meeting of the Health and Human Services. 
We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Everybody in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Let's move on. 2001 budget. Okay, yeah, uh, 2021 budget. Uh, yeah, 2001 was a lot of years. <laughs> if you want to go back to that one, we're in good shape. Um, you were presented with a, a big packet of information uh, last month or a couple months ago, uh, and not much has changed with the health and human services budget uh, since that time. We've had a couple more meetings uh, with the department and all departments actually. Um, and the, the Health and Human Services budget, uh, you know, there's there good news and bad news. And just um, to summarize, uh, the good news is their, their operational budget is pretty even uh, compared to last year. They did a good job in, in controlling uh, some of the costs so that they were able to do the, the operations of their main functions uh, at pretty much the same level as last year for uh, the same cost. Where the problem comes in, are those out of county placements? Uh, you know, the Winnebago uh, costs and the, uh, with the other one is child welfare placements. Child welfare uh, placements. And that's what increased their budgets, you know, by three quarters of a million dollars. <laughs> um, and how do we take care of that? How do we fund that? That's, that's been the issue. Um, and, and we've looked at a couple of things uh, to get there. And obviously, this is just one department, and we've got the whole county budget to also put together. And there's other problems in other departments as well. But how do we handle the health and human services department overage of three quarters of a million dollars? What uh, Mike Keith and I have been talking about is utilizing uh, the fund balance. And in health and human services, they have their own fund balance. That's the accumulation of revenues over expenses over time. If you always beat your budget, you're slowly generating fund balance, which is a good thing because that fund balance is needed in times such as these to uh, help offset um, some of these unexpected or uh, hard to overcome overages. So we've got about a million dollars in fund balance available um, to use for this um, purpose, if we are so inclined to do so. The alternative is to cut three quarters of a million dollars of services out of a budget. Uh, it doesn't have to be health and human services budget, but it does need to be three quarters of a million dollars of operating costs that would need to be cut in order not to use that fund balance. So that's uh, a big chunk of either this budget or somebody's budget. Um, and at this point, since that fund balance is available, that's part of the plan to balance this budget, is to utilize that fund balance if needed um, to balance that, that health and human services budget. There are a couple of things that could happen. Um, and health and human services has, has beat their budget uh, over the last five, six, seven years, and which has caused that um, fund balance to accumulate. So, you know, it, it could happen again, just like this last year. We didn't budget that much for those out-of-county placements, but they did beat the budget overall, so it, it's a positive balance. Um, and so I would hate to cut needed services when perhaps they could meet the budget again. Now, this is a big hurdle, and we're probably going to have to use fund balance in any scenario, and we've been lucky over the past that they've been able to beat the budget. Um, so it, it's uh, kind of a calculated risk as far as how we would balance that budget. Of course, the alternative again is, is cutting services. And at this point, um, you know, in discussions with Paul and his staff, um, you know, there's a, we're bare bones in a lot of the services that they have to provide. And to cut services, especially in this department, when we've got some fund balance available, um, you know, that's kind of what we're leaning towards at this point. Uh, but looking for feedback uh, from this group, um, because if push comes to shove in front of the full board as well, it's like if, if we need to cut services, what are they going to be and how are we going to handle it? So part of the discussion, I think, for this group is, where do you want that to go? Are you comfortable in utilizing that fund balance to that extent, which is extensive? Um, 
or do you want to look at other alternatives? I kind of open the floor to discussion on your feelings on where we're at. <coughs> this budget. Floor is open. Who wants to go first? So there's enough money in the fund balance to cover the shortage of the three quarters of a million dollars? There is currently. You know, the other thing is we are not through 2020 yet. So, you know, depending on what the fund balance is at the end of 2020, um, you know, if they don't be budget and we have to use that fund balance to shore up this budget, then there isn't. So, um, but at this point, you know, there's over a million dollars. Uh, to use against the $762,000 overage at this point. And so that the way we have the budget built now is utilizing $762,000 of fund balance to offset the overage. And does your fiscal year end in October? Or? No, it, at the end of the year. So it, it wouldn't be until like February, March before. Later? Uh, yeah, even later than that, into 2021, to know the full effects of what happened in 20. Um, it's more like May. Our final reconciliations for some of our major programs are until May of 2021. The, you know, your third option is we increased the budget because we were trying to get more realistic. Just don't have us budgeted like we haven't in the past. Yeah, no, the budget is over because we increased that uh, that Winnebago budget from 175,000 to 600,000, and likewise another 342,000 in the child welfare area, trying to make those more realistic. So it, it's kind of a balance, and so then they would be in the budget, you know, in following years. So we're trying to ramp up that budget uh, to acknowledge that we have had now more placements than we've had in past years. Um, but to do that at the expense of the other programs, when these placements are totally out of our control, essentially, um, but we get saddled with the cost as a county. So, I mean, there's efforts on the legislative end. We go down and, and bound on doors at the state level to say this is not fair to counties to have us pay, uh, you know, for two people, uh, you know, a million bucks when we've got a whole county to take care of. It's it's real hard to get things to balance in that case. Is that likely going to be the case next year as well? I mean, we're going to be faced with the same. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's possible these race. people could be so, here in, in those facilities long term. Well, you could have other ones that have to go in. Right. Yeah. So you don't know. So it's kind of a short, like it's a short term fix, but. Right. Yeah, right. You're you're we, buying a year. Mental health is a long term fix. It's hard. To fix. Well, right now, Joe Bordo. I mean, it's either going to be Winnebago or more expensive for both people that are living there. And Joe has been on the phone line with Winnebago. There's one resident there they'd like to place out of there, but it's going to cost us $2,000 $2,500 a day, which is about twice as much as paying in Winnebago. So you can't, placements aren't out there for this. What's the alternative if we don't pay? We don't have they a choice, they withhold our money. Yeah. yeah, they don't give us any of our funding. They take their cuts off the top. And to add insult to injury, they raise their rates 4% <laughs> starting October 1st. Oh, so. <sighs> we actually have an out of state resident there right now, which the state has a program for us to get reimbursed. But we're still on the hook for the first 72 hours of a hold. Doesn't matter if they're in state or out of state residents. So, in 72 hours is a lot more easier to deal with than a year, yeah. two years. At what point does the state take responsibility? This would exhaust and bankrupt counties. Right now, no that's been our argument. Yeah. There's, there's no way to make this. That right. is correct. Exactly. Yeah. We talked to our representatives in the legislature and the Senate and the Assembly several times in the past few years through the county ambassador program. And they all agree, oh, this is terrible. We gotta do something. And they all sit on their hands and throw, sit on their feet and throw their hands and do nothing. Tom, wasn't there recently some movement though with Wisconsin counties to what increase the levy limits or no. Net new, I mean, 
But we threw that out there, right? We, we proposed on that. Uh, well, there was some talk about um, changing the language in that statute instead of net new construction, just to new construction. Right. right now, you, you take the value, add the, the new construction, and then deduct off uh, the other property that was deleted. So you have net new construction. But if you just add value without subtracting something else off, that would give us a little bit more room, but it's still not sufficient to battle this kind of a cost. Um, you know, but that's what Dale was talking about. It was it's kind of part of the argument about not cutting services at this point. I mean, if we are successful in getting a legislative change to take that burden off the counties, you know, then why did we cut three quarters of a million dollars of services that we can now add them in? It's a long shot that this is going to happen, but. Um, you know, it, it's it's playing our last hand essentially of not having to cut services until absolutely necessary, um, or it's putting the blinders on and avoiding. We're going to have to do it anyway. But um, well, then, if it's health and human services cutting um, services, then I wouldn't need any legal counsel because you're putting the county at risk and the stuff that we have to do. And it's beyond anything I can make a decision on by myself without right. having consulting with an attorney. Just. So why why don't we just take this one amendment and go with the go with the what's proposed and we'll deal with whatever later. What's the kind of well, I mean, <laughs> the problem with that is, is and, and here is the problem is that you don't find out until you're doing your 2022 budget where you're at for 2020. In reality, so you really don't know yeah. where your fund balance is until what the auditors are coming tomorrow. That's when you're going to really they're shoring up what last 2019 was. Right. So you're really not. But we know we're now three quarters in the hole. Well, well that's, so that's what I'm projecting. Project. That's, okay. uh, that's 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 right now. But that was increasing. That's increasing our budget to get us more real. But so I guess, Patty, just like a top, Patty, the fund balance though, a lot of that's going to cover the 2020 overage. If we are, True. Over, we don't know where I we're going to I mean, you're projecting. We were, we're projecting for Winnebago and things, but you also haven't spent any travel. And you haven't spent, I mean, there's a I lot of things we haven't spent anything on. There's a lot we haven't been able to do. You know, so and have had open positions. So I mean that's why they've yeah. been able to build fund balances because even though that hasn't been budgeted appropriately overall in the budget, you know, on an eight and a half million dollar budget, they're able to save enough to still have a positive balance. So even if you know, even if that's true that uh, the out of placement costs are going to be three quarters of a million over, it's probably going to be less than that that we have to use if they right. need the budget and not greater. Right. And they didn't spend it all. Right, because and there's travel. exactly there's a lot of other things. We had a lot of staff that we positions that were open that we didn't fill for you know quite a bit of time. But they're also like um, public health. All those people were pulled and put to COVID, and we got funding in COVID. So then, you know, I mean, right. So we had staff yeah. costs covered other places. Save some money work from home. Not really. Not really. Not really. Not really. You don't works. really save any money. I mean, in fact, we had to buy cameras that came out of COVID, and we yeah. had to buy things, so it didn't save any money. But um, but on staffing, we had COVID money to cover some people that would have been like an agency expense or you know public health, which is a county money expense. We don't. I I really can't until we see what's going to happen in school, but I can't really even project what's happening because until kids went back to school, child welfare referrals were way down. Now they're anticipating that all of a sudden the floodgates are going to open here, you know, that kids are back in school. Um, I don't know what changed with the elderly because for a long time we weren't getting many APS referrals either. I think they were staying home. Now it must be that families are coming to visit their relatives again. At least a bit, because all of a sudden, Lori's saying that her intakes are, which pulls people, and our costs, you know, go up to there. It so it, it's a very unusual year. I really can't tell you. I mean, we've we've also had positions. I mean, just in clerical, I've been down four positions. 
you know, we're getting two bills here, but I mean, we still saved enough money in the meantime here to. Well, you hate not to be able to provide services for the people. You don't want to stop that in the, right. in the middle of a pandemic. We need to keep things going the best we can. Can we do a parcel? Can we, can we have part of it to decide for that? And watch what happens for the next few months? Or? But essentially, it comes out the same way. I mean, if you don't budget it, you're still going to spend it. So it, it's it's using the fund balance any way you look at it, I guess. You know the way it's presented now i think is a better uh way of presenting it so that the board realizes that we do have a problem you know it's it's not okay you know we've got a balanced budget but oh we know this is happening over here this is saying we know what's going to happen and this is how we're going to fund it the fund balance rather than you know sweeping it under the rug and saying we hope it's for the best this is not the best way you know to budget using fund balance to that extent I just don't see a lot of alternatives at this point other than drastically reducing services, which I would rather not do if we've got that last pot of money to extend before we have to do something more drastic. What about, what about your whole short term borrowing and issuing debt for capital? You haven't said anything about that in health and service. Yeah, and, and that's where. Um, you know, the budget could be balanced by not cutting health and human services, but by doing something else in other departments. And what are those other things? You know, maybe cutting services in other departments or um, or treating more of the capital items as um, short term debt rather than within the operating levy. So we still have a lot of highway capital uh, infrastructure that within the operating levy. So we could still move some of that off of operating capital, issue debt for it, which which creates then the room on the operating side. It's just a matter of that is increasing taxes. So if you issue debt and pay that debt off, their debt service gets added on outside the levy limit. So here's your levy limit. Now you're going to put debt on the top of that. Your taxes go up. So it's a matter of how much taxes the constituents can tolerate in any given year. So that's the flip side. It, I mean, it, there's room to do that, but there's not room to increase taxes for management. Especially if we're going to be doing the courthouse. Right, that'll oh, add thanks. significant. So, yeah, yeah, wait, wait till finance comes out. Yeah. But at least we're not cutting services during the pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So again, you know, this is the way the budget is built. Um, at this point, you know, we're still putting together all the pieces of all the department budgets, and that's you know our job. Uh, Mike, Keith, and I, uh, and the administrator, puts all that together, makes his best um, estimate on how things should be, and this is the way it is now. And then I present that to the county board, and then the county board can make any changes uh, that they see fit before the budget gets adopted. But currently, this is the way the budget is built. Want you to be aware of it. This is where we're at. Unless you've got uh, any serious issues with it, I think that's what we'll go forward with and mm -hmm. take it from there. Can I've had. Uh, can I ask something? I've had my hand raised. John. Yes. Go ahead. Mr. Ha, so there is no way that we can uh, borrow the money like we're doing for the courthouse. As I was, I was listening. I was going to bring that. That was my thing, but please brought it up. So there's no way we can do that. And then we're looking at cutting services, which is, I was just staunch opponent against the courthouse because if we could fund that, my stance was if you're going to fund that end of it. We need to fund the rest of the programs within the county and bring them to speed. There is no way we as county board supervisors can sit and say we're going to cut services, but we're going to fund for a courthouse. 
this has been my debate with the whole courthouse thing the whole time is that I was not willing to spend that money if we were looking at a deficit in health and human services and across the board in the courthouse in the in the building and we don't even have departments up to speed. Yeah, just to, to clarify, um, you know, the court building uh, would be funded by debt. So if that doesn't affect any of the operations, we don't have to cut services because we're issuing debt for a courthouse. Um, because that can be issued, uh, funded by debt, but it does increase taxes. So, um, you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, the taxes go up, it doesn't cut services at all to build the courthouse. Operations, yes. Uh, capital items, no. So why not, instead of, like I said, instead of funding the courthouse through debt, we should have funded our programs through debt. We can't use borrowed money to fund our programs. That's against state statute. Yeah, that is correct. You, you can't uh, issue debt for operations, only for longer, you know, a longer term asset. A building that lasts 20 years, you can issue debt for. Salaries for a person, you can't issue debt for. Who says that? State statutes. You can't issue debt for um, current operations. This is what I, this is what I've been saying the whole time, this is what it was going to come down to. And I, I am not going to sit in front of my constituents and say I'm cutting services. There's no way. Well, we're going to have to figure something out. Well, that's what we're trying to do is figure out other options. Oh, please. If it's against the law to put um, to borrow to pay for services, how can the state increase our Winnebago costs and mandate that we have to serve no matter what? Are we the only, we can't be the only county no, that's- we're not the only county. This is the problem. This is the problem. Okay, we hear it. Northwest Regional Planning Committee hears this. And fights against that in all the counties. It's one of those things about government. Congress passes laws that they don't need to follow. Congress tells the states, we have to do these programs that they don't fund. So the state does the same thing to us. We have to be the short end of the stick. <clears throat> well, that's my budget speech. <laughs> well, okay. I have to think about what we need to think about is anything. Anything we can come up with out of streamliner operation, become more efficient. Well, we've been doing this for the last 20 years. We picked all the low hanging fruit. Uh, it was not coming this, everybody knew it. And here it is. Let's just move on to the, unless anybody has anything else to add. Oh. Uh, the budget performance report. And purchase and service recap. Um, the only thing that I've got is what we've just been talking about. I mean, if you look at your purchase service recap, um, this is the report in July. And in Winnebago, we budgeted $175,000 and we've already spent $486,504. Um, Auto home placements. For just RCCs, we budgeted three hundred twenty thousand, and this is through July. But it, we only made six months worth of payments to RCCs. Um, we've spent three hundred forty-six thousand. So if you take that and you double it, that's that's why we increased the budget. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. 
Okay, any other items for discussion normally? You know, on, uh, last uh, last meeting, I wasn't able to say, uh, Dave Bauer got up, he read a letter, and I comment, and I just wanted to, he's been here since 1987, and I wanted to recognize that fact and thank him. And I didn't get a chance to do it, and that's why I'm here in person again, because of the Zoom, it, it just doesn't, it, it is what it is. But that's why I'm here, and I just want to, uh, my hat's off to Dave Bauer, and I hope he uh, enjoys his retirement. Did he retire officially now? October 15th. October 15th? 11th. All right, 11th. Is the county doing anything for? Yeah, I'm just looking at Paul. Paul, what do you want to do? Tom? The Stepping out of line, I'm always given another. Um, yeah, three year plan. Did he get one though? I think so. Yeah, he well, got a, he got a three year plan, but I mean, it's it's missed on. If you do anything for people or you don't, it's, it's it. There's no policy. We don't have any policy for Lexus. Generally, there used to be uh, staff to show. Well, we can't have a party. Yeah, we used to. Yeah, we used to have yeah. Party. Yeah. <laughs> Drive by party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you wear a mask and you split it so you can have a piece of cake. <laughs> All right. Well, good blame. We'll talk. Okay. Why don't uh, somebody do an article for the paper out regarding Dave Bauer? Well, that's something to think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. People tonight, I don't know if you noticed, but I wasn't necessarily recognizing everybody. It was because this was a good discussion. Everybody was waiting for everybody else to say their thing. Everybody was jumping on top of each other. Good job, people.